dear friends, it is a great joy to know that very soon we will, as a people of God, enter into the holy city, the new Jerusalem. But before that, before the second coming of your Lord Jesus, we will have to experience a different kind of war, a spiritual war, a spiritual war between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdoms of this earth. The year 2025 is a very special year. It is a very important year for Satan to introduce the formation of church and state, the coming together of political powers and religious powers and working together, a unity, a fusion of church and state. The year 2025 is a very important year for Satan to take control of the whole world. And they will be working through the Republican Party of the United States. And this will take place in the year 2025, Sunday as a day of rest by law in the United States. This is the plan, this is the program, and they will carry out the strategic planning for bringing Sunday as a day of worship. Now the question is, are some of our religious leaders also involved in this kind of agenda, ag agenda or project 2025? Religious leaders together with politicians, together with government officials, working together, praying together, worshiping together. We will be presenting this in this talk. Because they want to introduce Sunday as a day of worship. And this will be before time of probation, before time of probation closes, it says in the book, The Last Day Events, page 227, the Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. And then we read in the book, Last Day Events, page 134, it is at the time of the national apostasy when acting on the policy of Satan, the rulers of the land will rank themselves on the side of the man of sin. It is then that the measure of guilt is full. The national apostasy is the signal for national ruin. And the people of God are not in darkness so that these things will take us by surprise. As a thief in the night, we are warned, we know, and the people of God will suffer. As we see national, natural disasters, the politicians are engaged in worship. This is a kind of worship. This is at the convention of the Republican Party on the night that they announced the nominations, the nominees for presidential and vice president as a running mate. Uh, Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, the two leaders running for the presidency of the United States. And they came together and celebrated and worshiped 
and pray. And it's interesting because they were praying to the spirits of demons, and we will also cover this. But Donald Trump says he is, he is worshiping the God of the Christians, and they want to declare the United States as a Christian nation. In the book, 1 John 5.20, we see whom do we worship? Who is the true God? And we read and we know that the Son of God is come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. In making preparations for Sunday as a day of worship, they have to come together, religious leaders and government officials. They must come together and worship and pray. But they are praying to the spirits of demons. They are not praying to the true God. And the sad thing is that agenda Project 2025 is a religious and political uh, political agenda. This is what we will be studying in this topic. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for blessing us. We pray for your guidance, for understanding, spiritual discernment, Help us, dear Father. In the name of your Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Trump assassination attempt lays bare deep religious divisions in the United States. Trump supporter, Pastor Robert Jeffries, preached that that very chosen mess to his congregation at First Baptist Dallas on the Sunday morning after the assassination attempt. Why the very chosen mess? Because they believe that Donald Trump has been chosen by God to regain the presidency. And not only that, to bring the nation of the, the United States back to Christianity. But this is a different kind of Christianity back to the papacy. Let us continue. What happened yesterday is also a demonstration of the power of Almighty God. He said, as the congregation began applauding, I mean, what happened was inexplicable apart from God. God spared him for the purpose of calling our nation back to its Judeo-Christian foundation. And remember, the prophecy says that the United States will deceive the whole world. And Donald Trump's assassination attempt is another of those strategies of Satan to unite church and state, to bring national apostasy, to bring the image of the beast, nationalism, Christian nationalism, as they call it. And indeed, there was an assassination, assassination attempt, but they are using it to integrate the principles of the papacy into the political religious concept of leadership and governance in the United States. It says Trump is trying to distance himself from Project 2025, but its architects helped shape his Republican National Convention Party platform. And this paper also says there is another link between Trump's campaign and Project 2025. It says Senator J.D. Vance, Republican Ohio, 
GOP presidential nominee, nominee Donald Trump's newly minted, newly minted running mate, praised and worked and wrote the foreword for an upcoming book penned by an architect of Project 2025. The right wing presidential transition project from which Trump has desperately tried to distance himself in recent weeks. The book Dawn's Early Light by Heritage Foundation President Kevin Roberts is scheduled for release in September. My description from its publisher says it blazes a war path for the American people to take back the country and says conservatives should burn down various corrupt institutions, including the Department of Education. Bringing back, gaining back America as a country. Make America great again. Make America pray again. Make America worship again. That's the agenda. This one says five faith facts about J.D. Vance, Catholic convert and Trump's VP pick, vice presidential nomination. Vance converted to Catholicism in August of 2019 when he was baptized and confirmed at St. Gertrude Priory in Cincinnati, Ohio, by Henry Stephen, a Dominican friar. According to an interview with American expatriate and writer Rod Dreher, who was present at the baptism, Vance chose St. Augustine as his patron saint. What does it mean choosing Augustine as a patron saint? It means that he can communicate with the spirit of the dead. He can pray to the spirit of the dead and also receive guidance, protection, and many other things. So Augustine is the spirit of the dead guiding this vice presidential nominee for the American nation. In the book, Last Day Events, page 134, let us read, Roman Catholic principles will be taken under the care and protection of the state. This national apostasy will speedily be followed by national ruin. Yes, the Roman Catholic teachings will be taken under the care and protection of government officials in the United States. And this is what is called national apostasy, which indeed will bring national ruin. The once secretive right-wing ideology emerging as an overt threat to American democracy, says this paper. In Oklahoma, the state's top education official has ordered the public schools to put a Bible in every classroom and incorporate its teachings into their lessons. In Louisiana, officials have decreed that every public school classroom must display the Ten Commandments. What's going on in our nation, which was founded on the principles of religious freedom and separation of church and state? That's the question the public is asking. What's taking place in the United States? And the people of God know that this is fulfillment of Bible prophecy, church and state stuff. The union of church and state 
to bring about the papacy back to dominance. And this is what is called the image of the beast. In the book, Last Day Events, page 134, it says, when the state shall use its power to enforce the decrees and sustain the institutions of the church, then will Protestant America have formed an image to the papacy and there will be a national apostasy which will end only in national ruin. So here we see the image of the beast is the image of the papacy. How it shall be formed in the United States when the government shall use its power to enforce the decrees and sustain the institutions of the church. This is what they want. The United States, wandering after the beast, bowing down to the papacy and to Roman Catholicism to sustain and protect the teachings of Roman Catholic traditions and the papacy. Ten Commandments in Louisiana schools, supported by Donald Trump. It says he had previously posted on his social media network, I love the Ten Commandments in public schools, private schools, and many other places for that matter. Read it. How can we as a nation go wrong? How can we as a nation go wrong? Bible prophecy is being fulfilled even in our days. The image of the beast is taking place even as we, we present this message. And this is called apostasy, national apostasy. These make America great again leaders claim God spared Trump's life. Did divine intervention, intervention save Donald Trump from certain death in Pennsylvania? Marco Rubio and Charlie Kirk are apparently believers and the whole nation is deceived. There are many people questioning why this took place even at this present time in history and in the political history of the United States. And we know for sure this is Satan's workings to bring about church and state together and also bringing about the Sunday worship crisis. Landry, he says the Ten Commandments could have stopped Trump. Trump's would-be assassin. And this is the report. Louisiana also, public schools are not Sunday schools. ACLU to sue United States over the Ten Commandments in schools display. Last day events, page 133, when our nation in its legislative councils shall enact laws to bind the consciences of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh day Sabbath, then the law of God will, to all intents and purposes, be made void in our land. And national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. So this paper continues saying Republican govern governor Jeff Landry signed a law on Wednesday requiring public school classrooms in Louisiana to display the Ten Commandments. And what did he say? If you want to respect the rule of law, you've got to start from the original lawgiver, which was Moses, Landry said. And here there is a fault. 
It was not Moses. It's not Moses the lawgiver. The lawgiver in the Bible is God, the creator. And the commandments, of course, were written by the Holy Spirit, given to Moses, but he is not the lawgiver. So what is this at play? They are playing politics, and politics is deceptive. They deceive, but they cannot hide everything. They are not worshiping the God of the Bible. And we will show that they are worshiping the spirits of demons. When they bring together religious leaders and government officials, they come to worship idols. And they come to invoke the spirits of the dead. And the Adventist leaders in the general conference in the United States and the North American division in the United States, they are also involved worshiping together with those who are worshiping and invoking the spirits of demons. We will also present all those things in this presentation. This paper says many believe the founders wanted a Christian America. Some want the government to declare one now. The United States Constitution doesn't mention Christianity or any specific religion. The Declaration of Independence famously proclaims that people's rights come from a creator and nature's God, but doesn't specify who that is. That's what they say. But they are arguing that church should be separated from state cannot join together. And they know because persecution will be resulting from a unity of church and state. This paper says Mark Robinson calls for a conservative faith movement driven by love in Milwaukee remarks. He says North Carolina Lieutenant Gover Governor Mark Robinson speaks on stage on the first day of the Republican National Convention. What did he say? This is an American governor, Lieutenant Governor. This is a government official and he's preaching like a pastor. He says Christians in this nation for too long have used the church as a country club, as a meeting place for gathering to do business. Robinson said, a church is not a place where we are supposed to be meeting for the purposes of making money or making friends or spreading our own message. A church is a place where we are supposed to be spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the government will force all, all people to worship on Sunday in any place of worship. This will take place in the United States. And they are very serious. They say church is not to come to make social gatherings and to make new friends. Minnesota GOP candidate, Steve Boyd wants to make America Christian again. What does he mean? Steve Boyd wants to lead Americans back to God. Republican running in deep red Western Minnesota in, is mounting a campaign that's a religious, that is as religious as it is political. And he says the country needs to be steered back to his Christian roots. This is the power of the beast, working through government officials. He suggested that Democrats have evil ideologies. Describe those pers pro prosecuting former President Donald Trump as having a godless agenda and said the notion of church and state separation has been misunderstood. So this is the process. 
This is the plan. Union of Church and State by the year 2025. So we must be awake. We must be awake because time of probation is soon to be closed. And we must receive the seal of the living God. And we must follow the lamb wherever he goes and obey God rather than man. And there is no fear, but the fear of God. The Texas GOP convention, Republicans call for spiritual warfare. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Senator Angela Paxton, Republican McKibney said Friday, it is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's what they say. Look at what the Democrats have done. United States Senator Ted Cruz, Republican Texas said Saturday, if you were actively trying to destroy America, what would you do differently? So every place in, from every angle, politicians and religious leaders pushing for a religious agenda. This is another senator. Senator Howley delivers national conservatism. He note the Christian nationalism we need. And here you will see fulfillment of Bible prophecy because these senators are pushing the agenda of the papacy, protecting, defending the principles of the papacy and also protecting the teachings the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. This paper says Christian nationalism founded American democracy. Read Senator Josh Howley's full remarks on NatCon. Senator Josh Howley spoke Monday night at the National Conservatism Conference. In his speech, he contrasted Christian nationalism with other kinds of nationalism. By contrast, he says, Augustine's Christian nationalism has been the boast of the West. It has been our moral center and supplied our most cherished ideals. Talking about Augustine, St. Augustine, the theologian of the Roman Catholic Church, Augustine, the man that was the writer for the Inquisition of the Roman Catholic papacy. Augustine was the think tank, the thinker of the persecution by the papacy against Christianity. That's Augustine. And we will read more about him. Because politicians in the United States, they are talking about St. Augustine as their leader, as their leader, as their spiritual guide that they can talk to, that they can invoke. And Augustine as the main thinker for the union of church and state. So it says, just think, those stern Puritans, disciples of Augustine, they gave us limited government and liberty of conscience and popular sovereignty. That's not true. Puritans were not the disciples of St. Augustine. It's a deceptive teaching, it's a deceptive statement. And then he says, this is Senator Howley, we are a nation forged from Augustine's vision. Is that true? I don't think so. Because the people that came into the United States, they were escaping. They were fleeing away from the papacy in Europe. And they wanted a nation without the king and without the pope. But this man says that the nation was formed or forged from Augustine's vision. 
a nation defined by the dignity of the common man as given to us in the Christian religion. And then he says, now we need not the ideology of Rand or Mill or Milton Friedman, but the insight of Augustine. This is the, the Republic, uh, the, the, the Republic Party of the United States. They want to bring Roman Catholicism teachings into the, the United States as I hold. And then he says, in his dream, when his dream became a reality, this is St. Augustine's dream. A thousand years after Augustine's wrote, some 20,000 practicing Augustinians ventured to these shores to found a society here on his principles. And then he says, history knows them as the Puritans. Inspired by the city of God, they founded the city on a hill. The city of God is a book written by Augustine. And he's not talking about the new Jerusalem in heaven. He's talking about the Vatican. But the Bible says that, that the city of Rome, the, of the papacy, is the throne of Satan. That's where Satan lives. That's where the headquarters of Satan are. That's the city they call the city of God. And they say the Puritans who went into the United States, he says they were inspired by the book of Augustine, the city of God. We will see more about this. And they, this paper says what the GOP gets wrong about the Puritans, what the Republicans get wrong about the Puritans. He says in England, the Puritans constituted a religious minority who opposed the state-sanctioned Church of England, which they believed had betrayed true faith. By leaving for North America, many believed they were testing whether their distinct vision of Protestant Christianity could survive in a new continent. And what about the spirit of prophecy? In the book, The Great Controversy, page 296, we read about the Puritans, the Puritan settlement in the United States. It says, one might be for years I dwell in the Puritan settlement and not see a drunkard or hear a noise or meet a beggar. The feeble and isolated colonies grew to a confederation of powerful states when the world mark, marked with wonder the peace and prosperity of a church without a pope and a state without a king. So these are the principles of the true republicanism that founded the United States a church without a pope, and a state without a king. These were the principles of the Puritans, of the Puritan settlement. So they were not uh, the disciples of St. Augustine. Puritans were fleeing away from the papacy and from the king. They wanted to have a republic not a, a monarchy and not a theocracy. They wanted to have a true democracy. This is the book, The City of God by St. Augustine. And it says, St. Augustine, City of God. This, the first serious attempt at a philosophy of history was to have incalculable influence in forming the European understanding of the relations of church and state and the Christian's place in the temporal order. The Christian's place in the temporal order. 
they had to submit to the authority of the Pope, that they have to accept church and state working together. Remember, the papacy is a state and it is a religious, uh, a religion. And that's why it's called the beast. And the image of the beast is the coming together of church and state, unity of church and state. What about this? Because in the Sabbath school quarterly of 2021, they used St. Augustine, City of God, from the book, City of God, they used this long quote, and they encouraged the Adventist church to follow the example of St. Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, from the city of God. And they put this long quote in the Sabbath school quarterly. It says, Augustine wrote of the human condition. And then they talk about the so many iniquities, so many sins and violence and decadence, spiritual immorality. And then in the middle, they say, also, what about the, the sins against the church? Such as perfidy and pride and envy and ambition and homicide. And then they say, the, the, the iniquities, injustices, violence, and also, the sins against the church, such as sacrilege, blasphemy, heresy, perjury. And it was Augustine, the one responsible for the Inquisition. It was because of his writings that they were punishing heretics, that they call heretics, and burning them at the stake. It was because of the writings of St. Augustine that millions of Christians were destroyed, were killed, annihilated, persecuted, beheaded, drowned, burned at the stake, crucified by the Inquisition. Why? Because they were fallen, or they had fallen according to the papacy under this section of sinners against the church as sacrilege, heresy, and blasphemy that was punishable by death. The book of Revelation talks about this great city, and this is not the city of God, it is the city, the headquarters of Satan, the city of iniquity, the city of the man of sin. Revelation 17, verse 18 says, And the woman which thou sowest, is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. It was the papacy that, that commanded, invited all the presidents of the European Union come meeting together in this great city. The city that rules or rules over the kings of the earth, reigneth over the kings of the earth. This is another depiction of this great city. Revelation 17, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. This is the great city. The book of Revelation calls it the great whore. Babylon, the great, the mother of all, har of all harlots. And it is decked with gold, precious stones, and arrayed in purple and scarlet. In the book of Revelation, we see the true city of God. Not the city of God as St. Augustine has written, as it is the Vatican, the city of wickedness, but the city of the real God, the true God, Revelation 3, verse 12. 
Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. We shall have the new name of our Lord Jesus in us and the name of the city of our God in heaven. J.T. Vance on why he didn't convert to Catholicism sooner and why St. Augustine is his patron saint. St. Augustine as his patron saint. He says, in the same interview, Vance discussed why he chose St. Augustine as his patron saint. He explained that several readings from Confessions and the City of God, what, what? The City of God by this Augustine revolutionized his thinking and that Augustine led him to understand his faith from an intellectual angle, which he brings into his politics. So he's using the ideologies of, of Augustine from the book, The City of God. This is the city of Rome, the papacy, to bring all these ideologies into his politics. This paper says Augustine's writings on forced conversion, origins of Calvinism and Islam. I wonder if this man, J.D. Vance was converted by force, I doubt it. But I believe he has been learning religion even from school, even from university studies. He had been reading the book, The City of God by Augustine. But this paper says, Augustine, forced conversion, origins of Calvinism and Islam, he says, one of the reasons why Roman Catholicism, Calvinism, and Islam have become some of the most widely practiced religions is because of sheer physical dominance. It is undeniable that all three religions have taken part in violence for forced conversion. And then he says, we see this through the torture of those who the church viewed as heretics, burning at the stake, beheadings, and other gruesome forms of violence. It has been thoroughly documented that Augustine of Hippo was the one who brought this practice into the church in its most aggressive form through his disputes with those he deemed as heretics. The best evidence for this is found in one of his personal letters, which was used to justify the Roman Catholic Inquisition starting in the 16th century. And this is one of those letters, Augustine, Augustine's letters 185, chapter six. This is the letter of Augustine. It says, it is indeed better as no one ever could deny that men should be led to worship God by teaching than that they should be driven to it by fear of punishment or pain. But it does not follow that because the former course produces the better man, therefore those who do not yield to it should be neglected. So they should be forced by pain, by death, if possible, by, by threat, threatenings of death, death penalty or death threats. And he says, for many have found advantage as we have proved and are daily, daily proving by actual experiment in being first compelled by fear or pain so that they might afterwards be influenced by teaching or might follow out in act what they had already learned in word, what they had already learned by fear or pain 
or punishment, corporal punish, punishment. And then he says, why therefore should not the church use force to in compelling her lost sons to return? If the lost sons compelled others to their destruction. So here we see the true Augustine, the true man who wrote the book, The City of God, Church and State Relations, and, and how they will bring persecution again to flourish in the United States, using the government and the church and religions to bring persecution against those who want to worship God according to their conscience. This paper says Latino evangelical support for Christian nationalism rises as Trump courts religious vote. And this man says, make America pray again. That's what they want. Everybody following or wandering after the beast. It says Trump's rhetoric is linked to the ideology of Christian nationalism which calls for America to be an unequivocal Christian nation in its laws and customs, and whose adherents don't believe in a separation of church and state. So declaring America as a Christian nation, they want to also use Christian law and Christian customs by legislation. They want to introduce Christianity as a driving force in politics and religion. This is what is called the image of the beast. And we see fulfillment even as we talk. This paper says what American Jews should know about Project 2025 and its connection to Christian nationalism. It says there are a number of reasons that Jewish leaders are among those alarmed by Project 2025. They see it as a step forward authoritarianism and erosion of freedom of religion and the empowering of Christian nationalist movement they see is steeped in anti-Semitism. But that cannot be true because the Bible says, the Lord Jesus said, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. This is in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end, he shall be saved. Who shall be persecuted and hated by all men? Those who follow the Lord Jesus, the Lamb, those who obey the Lord Jesus and his commandments. In the book, Last Day Events, page 132, laws enforcing the observance of Sunday as the Sabbath will bring about a national apostasy from the principles of republicanism upon which the government has been founded. The religion of the papacy will be accepted and the rulers and the law of God will be made void. He says the religion of the papacy will be accepted by the rulers and the law of God will be made void. This is national apostasy. And for that purpose, the year 2025 is a very, very key year in Satanism. Satan's taking control, full control of the United States of America and bringing in the notion, the religious teaching that church and state should go hand in hand working together. This paper says Project 2025's danger lies more in its assumptions than its proposals. Let us read. Hidden 
in an obscure corner of Project 2025, the Heritage Foundation's 900-page agenda for a potential second Trump administration is a concerning proposal for the Department of Labor. The idea found on page 589 of the mandate for leadership is to amend the Fair Labor Standards Act to encourage a nationwide communal day of rest. What they want to introduce? A common day of rest. Sunday as a day of worship. Sunday as a day of rest for the whole nation. It says corporations that schedule employees to work on that day will be required to provide overtime pay. And it says the document gives historical precedent for the proposal by declaring that God ordained the Sabbath as a day of rest. And that until recent years, the Judeo-Christian tradition sought to honor that mandate by moral and legal regulation of work on that day. So Project 2025, which is a, a project, an agenda of the policies of the Republican Party in the United States, is the program, the plan of bringing Sunday as a day of rest. And it says, if the proposal is implemented, the default communal day of rest will be Sundays. And then they say there is an exemption for those who want to worship from Friday sundown to Saturday sun, sundown. But this is politics. They promise, but they never fulfill those promises. Why? The Bible in the spirit of prophecy says, freedom of conscience shall not be respected in the United States. They will be coercion, they will be forced religion for all. Sunday will be a day of rest and a day of worship, a day for all Americans and for the whole world. Sunday shall be the day of worship. And we see what is taking place now in America, in the United States, is fulfillment of Bible prophecy. This paper says Trump, at, is, Trump is mainstreaming Christian nationalism. If elected, that agenda could greatly impact California, and not only California, the whole nation. He says, in my first term, I fought for Christians harder than any president has ever done before. You know that, you know that. And I will fight even harder for Christians with four, four more years in the White House. Trump told the National Religious Broadcasters Association, I get in there, you are gonna be using that power at a level that you've never used it before. This is what he said. And in the same speech, Trump echoed the goals of Project 2025, an ambitious policy agenda for a conservative administration's first six months in office, coordinated by the Heritage Foundation and authored by an array of conservative organizations, including ones that are led by Christian nationalists. Project 2025 syncs closely with an evangelical agenda to enforce a binary definition of gender while ending access to abortion, contraception, and end-of-life care among its myriad policy recommendations, the 900 Plus page home calls for a Republican president to do the following to outlaw transgender ideology as pornography and imprisoned teachers and school librarians who educate students about it. 
So they want to introduce punishment, imprisonment against teachers that teach transgender ideology or pornography or any other thing that is immoral. So this is punishment by imprisonment. What about those who, who do not want to worship on Sunday? What about those who do not want to regard the national Sunday law? Those who do not want to follow after the beast or wonder after the beast. This is another agenda of Project 2025 supported by Donald Trump. It says to recognize Sunday as a day of rest and a Judeo-Christian tradition and require employers to pay workers time and a half if they work the Sabbath. So he's saying Sunday is the Sabbath. Sunday as a day of rest and Sunday as a day of worship. This is the plan. This is the plan of Christian nationalism, which is called church and state union, which is called the image of the beast, apostasy. This is the nationalism they want to introduce, implement the rules, the laws, the teachings of the Roman Catholic papacy. And then he says, we're not winning the battle of America yet. He said, Phoenix needs a different level of prayer in the Holy Ghost, praying into an epistolic anointing that brings the government of God over Phoenix. And then this paper we find Trump supporters idolize him with religious fervor. It says Trump's speech last night suggested a lot more than simple political solidarity is at play here. He spoke of a spirit. What spirit is that? He spoke of a spirit that forged America. Do you remember what spirit forged America according to J.D. Vance? He says, Augustine. And according to Senator Howley, the spirit of Augustine is the one that forged America. And this Donald Trump says, we need that spirit, the spirit of demons to guide Americans, the spirit of demons and the communication with the spirit of the dead. That's what they are talking about. And we will see that Donald Trump is worshiping the spirit of demons at the national convention. We will see a video about this. This paper says, Donald Trump says, that he spoke about a spirit that forged America, a vision that is righteous, a cause that is pure, and our shared gl and glorious destiny. And then he says the following, those who counter his belief system are therefore trying to challenge unity, American destiny, and what is fundamentally right which obviously sounds an awful lot like dividing the world between the believers and non-believers. This is at the Republican National Convention. And this lady is praying a prayer for Donald Trump and he's praying to a, a Hindu, a Hindu idol. She's praying to a Hindu idol and at the national convention, all those people fighting for bringing Christianity back into America and they are worshiping the spirits of demons. They are worshiping the spirits of the dead and worshiping the spirits of deities of the tradition of the Hinduism uh, religion. So what Donald Trump is proposing, an agenda to bring America back to pray again, he knows what he's talking. He wants Americans to pray to the spirits of demons. And this is in accordance also to Bible prophecy that talks about 
Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen. Why is fallen? Because it, it has it has bowed down to the spirits of demons, to the spirits of devils. This is Wahe Guru that is worshipped worshipped by the Republican Party. This is the idol that Donald Trump is worshiping. And this is the idol that Donald Trump is accepting as his protector and defender. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, we read, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, it says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Revelation verse chapter 18, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, This is the voice of the Lord Jesus. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. This is a calling by the Lord Jesus. But at the national convention, there were some Seventh-day Adventists, at least Adventists nominally by name, like Dr. Ben Carson. And this paper says Dr. Ben Carson quotes Isaiah during Republican National Conference speech. And he says that God shielded Trump from death. And you will see these kinds of news in many different papers. Even today, as I speak, many more papers working night and day to bring about this news about Ben Carson talking in favor of Donald Trump. And this paper says, as it is published by the New York Times, Christian conservatives march ahead for God, for country, and for Trump. This is Christian nationalism. And Ben Carson is involved in this kind of Christian nationalism. And he was also present at the worshiping of that Hindu God or Hindu idol. And it says Ben Carson, the former secretary of housing and urban development said that when he saw his friend escape death by mere inches, his thoughts immediately turned to the book of Isaiah which says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. This is a very interesting paper. It says a religious rally, Trump's Republican National Convention fuses faith and politics. And this is the image of the beast. And this is the process of Christian nationalism, which is called apostasy. Apostasy, the image of the beast, church and state, not only working together, but worshiping together. And he says, this is a religious rally. And I'm not even sure I'd call it a civil religion. Remember that the papacy is a state and also a religion. That's why the woman riding upon a scarlet beast. Why? Because the papacy is the union of church and state. The papacy is a government and a religion. The Pope, he is a king and he is a bishop. This is a, a civil religion. But what is taking place in the United States, this writer says, I don't know what to call it. I better call it a civil religion, but the Bible calls it the image of the beast. Church and state coming together. 
So this paper continues saying civil religion has always been there in generic appeals to God. Said John Fair, a religious historian from Messiah University, who said the religious rhetoric surrounding Trump seems unique. And then he says the following, there is something different here. Now what we are beginning to see is Christian nationalism. My brothers and sisters in the Adventist faith, what we are beginning to see is the image of the beast. Apostasy, apostasy, apostasy. The image of the beast. Church and state fusion coming together in unity, worshiping together. And then he says, if you want to call it that, it is a fusion of politics and theological Christianity. Spirit of prophecy calls this the image of the beast. But what if the image of the beast is also hidden in the agenda of religious liberty by the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists? What if the unity of church and state, the image of the beast, nationalism, civil religion, is also hidden in plain view? This paper says a tapestry of faiths, North American Division's fifth prayer breakfast sparks unity in mission. And here we will see religious leaders from different denominations worshiping together, praying together to the different gods, to the different idols. And the Seventh-day Adventist leaders from the North American division worshiping and praying together. And not only religious leaders, but also government officials praying together. This is what is called church and state. This is what is called the image of the beast being supported, fomented by the Seventh-day Adventist leaders in the North American religion uh, division in the United States. And it says on January 18, 2024, roughly 110 local faith and civic leaders attended the fifth religious freedom prayer breakfast hosted by the North American division and organized by its public affairs and religious liberty department. So this is an agenda by the general conference, by the general conference, by the presidency of the general conference using religious liberty department and the North American division. What did they do? What was the program? It says the program participants and attendees represented 13 denominations. All 13 denominations praying together, worshiping together and planning together, including the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they don't believe that the Lord Jesus is the true God and they worship on Sunday. Baha'i faith, they worship on Sunday and they worship idols. Judaism, they don't believe in the Lord Jesus as the true God. Islam, they don't believe in, in the Lord Jesus as God. And they were praying together with Seventh-day Adventist or Adventism and other Christian denominations. Also representatives from Maryland state and local county governments. So this is what is called na Christian nationalism in practice. This is what is called the image of the beast in practice. They are worshiping together. This is what the spirit of prophecy calls the image of the beast. Season of prayer. To whom did they, did they pray? And is this abomination? We will see that according to the Bible, this is abomination. It's abominable in the eyes of God. We will see. In the season of prayer, the highlight of the breakfast was 
the six themed prayers. It's interesting, they used six prayers from different religious traditions and government officials. And it says, starting with a prayer for elected officials by Stanley Carson, Theus, senior director for the Institutional Religious Freedom Alliance, he asked God to restrain the power of government officials, armed forces, and private groups who might suppress the exercise of religion that they do not favor. And then it says, in her prayer for the community, Laura Hargrove, Interfaith Outreach Director for the Maryland, Maryland Governor's Office. So this is government worshiping and praying together with other religious leaders. And this was organized by the North American Division and General Conference also. This is at their doors. This is the North American Division. And what does this lady say in her prayer? This is government official, Maryland's governor's office of community initiatives. She underscored that the commonality among different faith groups is the God they serve. So she's saying they are serving the same God together with the presidents of the North American division. They are worshiping the same God and they are praying to the same God, serving the same God, invoking Martin Luther King. And this is something that she said in her prayer. Invoking means praying to the spirits of a dead man. In invoking the spirit of Martin Luther, invoking the spirit of demons in her prayer. And she says, this is Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision of a community transformed and transfixed in and on God. She petitioned God to empower attendees to embody his light, his love, his and joy in the vineyards to which he sent them. So they are invoking the spirits of Martin Luther King Jr. and praying this prayer that is a prayer for interfaith, for the interfaith community. Alison Char, this is another person, another, another lady, communication director for public affairs with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. She opened her prayer for elected officials on a celebratory note. And then it says, Chad continued, may they recognize and value the tapestry of different faiths whose efforts weave together this country. May they feel the faith and prayers offered on their behalf in our churches, in synagogues, mosques, and temples. What are they saying? That all religions worship the same God. Synagogues, the Jewish people, mosques, the, the Muslims, and temples, the different Hindus and Baha'i and different other temples that worship on Sundays. And then it says in churches, in relation to Protestants, evangelicals, and all those that worship on Sunday. And those who are worshiping here also, Seventh-day Adventist leaders, and they indeed are pushing the agenda of church and state apostasy. And they indeed will be encouraging people that there is nothing wrong in worshiping on Sunday because they are already worshiping with other religious leaders and they are already praying to the different religious tradition and God and idols. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 9, we read, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. I would not like to invite a president from 
the North American division and come and do a sermon or pray in my church. Why? Because he has already worshiped other idols. He has already prayed to the spirits of demons together with other religious leaders. I would not like to be in his presence praying because I know that he has already been praying to the spirits of demons and joining together forces for church and state. So that is I turning away from the law. These are religious leaders from 13 different denominations that worship on Sunday. They do not want to worship on the true Sabbath and worshiping the Lord Jesus as the true God. This is abomination. I would not like to be in their presence. I would not like to hear a prayer by these religious leaders of the Adventist church. And this paper also says a poignant moment occurred during a joint prayer between Craig Axler, Rabbi for Temple Isaiah, and Amjad Chowdhury, Imam for Ahmadinya Muslim community, addressing God as the Holy One of blessing. They prayed for strength to stand against the evil courage to combat hate, and the ability to heal a broken world. The prayer then took a hopeful tone because there is hope. Teach us to be stewards of justice and kindness, said Chaudhry. And this is, and this is applauded by the, by the North American Division Presidency. And this paper also says later, Johnson reflected, this is the president of the North American division, the rabbi and the imam doing a prayer for peace together in the midst of some of the most turbulent times in the world, that stands out to me most. So this man is praising these religious leaders who do not believe in the Lord Jesus. And these religious leaders who do not believe in the Lord Jesus, they commit sin. What about the leaders in, in the North American division, the president and vice president? They are also joining with those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus. In John chapter 3, verse 18, the Lord Jesus says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What is sin? What is the def definition for sin? Yes, of course, we know how the definition for sin is transgression of the law. That's the definition for sin. Is there any other definition for sin in the Bible? The Bible says, yes, there is another definition for sin. Anyone who doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus commits sin. And here, all those religious leaders, they do not believe in the Lord Jesus. They are sinners and they are worshipers of idols. I would not like to be in their presence. The Bible says clearly, John 16, verse 9. What is sin? Of sin because they believe not on me. So if you have fallen in the temptation of not believing in the Lord Jesus as the true God and believing in him, then you are in sin. You are sinning because sin is not believing in the Lord Jesus. And this paper also says, then Claudia Allen, Outreach and Communications Manager for the Howard County Office. This is another, another official, government official. County Office of Human Rights and Equity offered a passionate prayer for unity. She said, 
She ended with a call to action. And she said, thank you for the ways that you will use each and every person in this room to be an agent of unity this year. Agent of unity, the president of the North American division, an agent, an agent of unity this year. And then she says, we ask these things calling upon your many names. Creator God, Elohim, Yahweh, Allah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Alpha and Omega, Jesus the Christ, amen. So she's, she's praying to the different traditions, to the different religious, uh, religious figures. She's not praying to the true Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible. She is praying to the different gods in the different traditions. And they are calling for unity in action. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, we read and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. The presidents of the North American division, they cannot preach this gospel. They cannot preach the gospel of Revelation chapter 18. Babylon is fallen, is fallen because it's full of evil spirits, the spirits of demons. They cannot preach the three angels' message. And even the presidents of the general conference, they cannot preach the three angels' messages because they are joining hands with the papacy and they are following after the beast, wandering after the beast and following the agenda of the papacy. In the book, Last Day Events, page 134, we read, when Protestants are, Protestant churches shall unite with the secular power to sustain a false religion for opposing which their, their ancestors endured the fiercest persecution, then will the papal Sabbath be enforced by the combined authority of church and state. There will be a national apostasy which will end only in national ruin. For that reason, the North American division presidents and vice presidents, they are joining forces with civil governments worshiping under the same religion, praying in and under the guidance of the same religion, under the fervor of the same spirit, working in unity with the government. This is what is called church and state. This is what is called the image of the beast. And this is what is called national apostasy. And this is what is called religious apostasy that will be ending in national ruin. These are the paper. Nearly a hundred attendees celebrate freedom of conscience at North American Division Religious Liberty Dinner. And this is at the office of the Senate in the United States. And this is the United States Senator Susan M. Collins. She was the keynote speaker at the North American Division 18th National Religious Liberty Dinner, held in April 30, 2024, at the Durkins, Dirksen Senate Office Building. And then he says the North American Division 18th Annual Religious Liberty Dinner held on Tuesday, April 30, 2024 on Capitol Hill, Washington, D.C. celebrated a central human right, the freedom of religion or belief. It brought together close to 100 religious liberty advocates, government officials, academics, Seventh-day Adventist church leaders. 
what do they what do you call this this is the image of the beast hidden in plain view hidden in, in plain view because it has been published by the um, north american division uh publishing uh, uh magazine in the adventist church north american division and they brought together a hundred religious leaders and many government officials. For what purpose? To, to put their plans on the table and to pray together. Because they also pray together. They worship together. They, they serve a common God. But in the book of Luke, the Lord Jesus said, there has to be a division separation of church and state in luke chapter 20 verse 25 it says and he said unto them render therefore unto caesar the things which be caesar's and unto god the things which be god's however the north american division they are bringing together church and state to make planning together why? Because they do not want to receive persecution and they want to join forces with the Roman Catholic Church because otherwise they will be persecuted. This is what Johnson said. It says, an underlying theme for the night was stronger together. Stronger together with who? With the uh, 100 religious leaders and government officials there present for this dinner and for this religious event, because they worshiped and prayed together. And then it says, Johnson noted that there are 1.1 million Seventh-day Adventists in the United States, but 8 million Mormons, 30 million Southern Baptists, and 90 million Catholics. And then he said the following, if you don't build coalitions, you cannot survive. So these men are teaching that you have to join with the Roman Catholics and the other religious leaders. Otherwise, you cannot survive. You cannot survive the Sunday law crisis, so you must follow with them. You cannot survive the persecution coming, so you must join with them. What about the Lord Jesus when he says, the Bible says, whoever who wants to live a godly life, he will, he will suffer persecution. And dear brothers and sisters, we must obey God rather than men. And then it says, Calvin Watkins, North American Division Vice President, concluded the evening by asserting that the Adventist church is committed to religious freedom and it makes all of us stronger when we work together. What is this man saying? That we must work together with the papacy, with the other religious leaders from different traditions, work together. And this is the fulfillment of their mission. What kind of mission? Peace and safety. In the book, The Great Controversy, page 443, it says, it was apostasy that led the early church to seek the aid of the civil government. And this prepared the way for the development of the papacy. The beast, it was apostasy, seeking the, seeking the aid of civil government. This is apostasy, seeking the aid of civil government and worshiping together with them and other religious leaders. It says, Walkins then prayed. This is the vice president of the North American division. We thank you, O oh God, for the mighty champions here tonight. And then he concluded his prayer. In, 
in your name we pray. He didn't say in the name of the Lord Jesus. He said in your name, in the name of, of which God he was praying. In Psalms chapter 94, verse 20, we read, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which framest mischief by a law? Which one is the throne of iniquity? The papacy, the city, the Vatican City, which is the center, the headquarters of Satan, the throne of Satan. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frames mischief by a law? What law? Sunday worship by law. That's the apostasy. This quote, because I preach in three languages, today I preached in Indonesian language. And this quote has been taken out of the book, The Great Controversy, in the Indonesian language. I wonder why, because this quote is talking about the church of Laodicea. And it says, apostasy, apostasy, apostasy is engraven on the very front of every church. And did they know it? And did they feel it? There might be hope. But alas, they cry, we are rich and increased in goods and stand in need of nothing. Second Advent Library tract number 39, the book, The Great Controversy, page 388. Apostasy, apostasy, apostasy. And this is what is written in the front of every church. And this is the message for Laodicea who say we are rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, we, we read, in what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then it continues in verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Once again, the Lord Jesus is saying, come out of her, my people. Do not join with them. Do not join in celebration with them. Do not join in adoration, in worship, or in serving together with them. Do not, do not join in ecumenical gatherings. Do not join in ecumenical prayer because that's worshiping the spirits of demons, the spirits of devils come out from among them. This is a paper that talks about John Biden. And it says he quoted Augustine in his inaugural address. What would the saint think of their politics? That's what it says, this American Jesuit magazine. What would he think? This is communication with the spirit of the dead. And this also, what St. Augustine could teach Donald Trump. Once again, communication with the spirits of demons. Again, this paper, J.D. Vance's Catholic Conversion. Inspired by Augustine and the wreckage of the modern age. And he says, Vance cites a passage from the book of Augustine, City of God. Remember the book, The City of God, that was quoted in the Sabbath school lesson quarterly. Vance also cites or quotes a passage from the City of God which he had, he had to study at college, in which Augustine summarizes the decadent ways of Rome's ruling class. So this man had to study Augustine's writings. Why? Because he knew he was going to be an elected government official who knows what he can, he can become. 
And now he's running to be the vice president of America. He had to study Augustine. Is he a Jesuit? Is he a religious leader? Under the guise of a politician, this paper says God, Mammon, and Trump. Could the Ten Commandments use an update? And then he says people get commandment number four wrong. They think keeping the Sabbath holy means going to church. But that's fake news, they say. People play golf on Sunday. Golf courses are sacred. So they know what they are talking about. Politicians, they don't, want, they don't care about the true Sabbath in the Bible. They don't care about the true God from the Bible. They care about Sunday as a day of worship. And they care about uni union of church and state. This is what is called Christian coalition. And this uh, person, Lee Greenwood, he, he says, God save Trump and hope United States embraces faith again. He says, Lee Greenwood is positive Donald Trump surviving an assassination attempt was divine intervention. And he's praying it will result in a stronger Christian nation going forward. The country music star who's set to perform at the Republican National Convention Tuesday. So everybody's talking about Donald Trump surviving the assassination attempt to bring Christianity into politics. And now after they have achieved the big goal of bringing church and state together and deceiving the American people by the assassination attempt and deceiving the whole world, now they can rejoice and enjoy the Olympic Games in the city of Paris in France. But there is also an agenda to bring the Christian nationalism in fervor and against the, the, the practices at the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. This paper says Olympic opening ceremony triggers wrath of Christian nationalists. And Donald Trump was one of those who voiced his disagreement and his anger. And this is like instigating an anger in those who want a Christian American nation. It says, Trump condemns opening ceremony of Paris Olympics. And he says, Paris Olympics 2024 opening ceremony is disgrace. Los Angeles City 2028 won't have Last Supper parody at, says Donald Trump. Why? Because they were mocking the Last Supper by the Lord Jesus in the opening ceremony. And this is for the purpose of anger, angering those who fight for Christian nationalism in North America and in the whole world. And for the purpose of bringing church and state, of bringing morality that they call morality, but also bringing Sunday as a day of worship. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 454, we find this quote. It was not long before the poison had spread like a deadly infection through the camp of Israel. Those who would have conquered their enemies in battle were overcome by the wiles of hidden women. Remember in prophecy, women, churches, apostate churches. And this is at the banks of the river Jordan before coming into Canaan. What about today? We are at the banks of the river Jordan 
coming into the new Jerusalem, heavenly Canaan. But here the people of Israel, they were overcome by the heathen women. The people seem to be infatuated. The rulers and the leading men were among the first to transgress. And so many of the people were guilty that the apostasy became national. Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. My brothers and sisters, we are about to come into the new Jerusalem. And the Lord Jesus is calling you and me. Revelation chapter 3 verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. May that blessing be upon us. May that blessing and that prayer of your Lord Jesus be with us. May we remain loyal, faithful to the Lord giver. May we worship the Lord Jesus as the true God, May we continue worshiping the Lord Jesus forevermore. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for present truth, for the three angels' messages, for the fourth angel message of Revelation 18. We pray for forgiveness of our sins. We pray for our Seventh-day Adventist church, for our brothers and sisters worldwide. Help us to be awake. Help us, dear Father, to be prepared for what is coming ahead for the crisis of the Sunday law and help us to be overcomers. In the name of our Lord Jesus, in his holy name we pray, amen. Thank you so much, my brothers and sisters. It is a great privilege to continue to preach for the Lord Jesus. This is your, your fellow servant, your fellow co-worker, your brother in Christ, Brother Marcos Escobar. May God bless you. May God keep us faithful until the coming of our Lord Jesus. May we continue to worship our Lord Jesus forevermore. Amen.